Excellent. What a wonderful space. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you for having me here today. My name is Amy Robson, and as colleagues have introduced, I'm the Deputy Director at NHS England for Personalized Care. So, for those of you who know me and those of you who don't, I'm a bit of a data geek. So I do like talking a lot about data, and I'm going to get some facts to start us off. So some facts to get us going. One in seven people in England experience post-decision regret, largely with large decisions about their care, largely about surgery or big decisions to make. The consequence of that is not insignificant. It results in a significant amount of litigation, complaints, dissatisfaction, and overutilization of healthcare. Fact number one. Fact number two, five in 10 people in England do not feel included in the decisions about their care and have not done for the last 10 years. Fact. That's shocking. <laughs> and I think that all of us here today, in the spirit of rising to this, um, ra raising demand, raising need, of improving healthcare, need to understand the landscape that we're working in. Half of the people in England don't even feel included, let alone shared in the decisions about their care. Fact. Fact number three, where people lack confidence to self-manage their health and well-being, they are 10 times higher utilizers of services in health and care. Fact. We are all here today with that mission of trying to make the best use of our resources, the best outcomes for our patients, and, and satisfaction for ourselves as health and care professionals. This is the landscape that we're operating in. This needs to change. I'm here uh, largely as a, a, a national leader and an improver in health and care. The bottom image is the quadruple aims of healthcare improvement. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. I'm um, American, as you can tell by my accent, I'm from Boston, and um, that's the home of the IHI. The, we should all be aiming for the quadruple aims. The IHI encourages us to think top left, optimal health and equity for our people, population health. Top right, best outcomes, including experience. And by outcomes, I mean outcome measures, um, like length of stay and uh, patient recorded outcome measures, experience of care measures, that kind of genre of outcomes in a more meta sense. Bottom right, we want our workforce to be happy. We know that there's a strong correlation between a happy workforce, better safety, better outcomes of care, and frankly, better use of resources as well. And then lastly, if we get all of that right, then we get optimal use of resources a service that is thriving, not in the red, not struggling to manage the demand and the need of its population financially and from resources. I go through that intentionally in that order. Um, if, if I was talking to finance, it would be a slightly different order, but we know as health and care professionals that actually if we focus on our people, we focus on outcomes of the change we're trying to bring, and we focus on our people of the workforce, we will achieve that aim. So that's my challenge in the context of this very difficult rising tide of demand and need in health and care. Some more facts. This data is from the GP patient survey from England. The data is 2020 data. It's national data. This dashboard is publicly available and free and accessible and quite easy to use. If you're not using it, I highly recommend it. You can drill it down to PCN practice and place level. But this is the national data. This question is, how confident are you to manage issues arising from your health and care and conditions? You'll notice the trend in, so between 2018 to 2022, roughly 80%-ish of people say that they feel confident. But you'll notice a step change in the 2022 data. COVID has played a significant role in why our people are no longer feeling as confident to self-manage. We did that. An international pandemic did that. The health and care in infrastructure system did that. I'm very curious to see what the 2023 20, data, when it comes out later this summer, shows that this rising demand on top of the facts that I shared is of concern. Because remember, this picture is worsening. This is an outcome measure that's of concern to us. And when people lack that confidence to self-manage, they're higher utilizers of services. So the, the trend is worsening, and actually it was not great anyways. But the hope of this is that what we know is through health coaching approaches, that they, this can improve by up to 40% in over healthcare utilization. There's decades of evidence on this. This isn't new, but actually it's your roles, our roles collectively to bring that voice together in the context of what our population is telling us in England. Now this is a really busy slide. How many of people are familiar with disability adjusted life years and global burden of disease? A chunk, but a chunk not. Okay, so I'll just orient you to the slide. Global burden of disease is a, I don't like the naming of it, by the way, but it is what it is. We'll just accept that. 
um, and disability adjusted life years is a metric to look at life lived less well as a result of having a single organ disease or a single condition. The visual that's there, the pictures in blue are non-communicable diseases, the ones in orangey red are infectious diseases, and the ones in the bottom right, the green ones, are injuries or accidents. This is the data for England. This is collated by the World Health Organization from all of the data that we enter into EPR systems, uh, electronic um, patient record systems in, uh, across the world, and gets spit out into this area. Um, what this shows us is that each single organ disease or each diagnosis is, um, the size of it is based on the number of people in England. The color, the darkness of the color shows whether that trend is worsening over time. So you'll see the legend on the sort of middle to right side where it has like the minus and plus percentages. So what does this tell us? Most of the people in England who are living with a condition, specifically those living with long-term conditions, the vast majority of those whose life is lived less well is as a result of non-communicable diseases in England. If you look at this for other countries, it's different. But in England, this is our population. This is telling us something about our population of people. It's also telling us that some of the conditions are worsening in the impact on someone's quality of life, specifically diabetes, specifically some cancers, specifically drugs and alcohol. This is not insignificant in the context of the data that was previously shown. So it's unsurprising that it shows this in the disability adjusted life years. And this contributes towards the economic burden of health, but also over healthcare utilization, poor outcomes, and also system pressures. We're in a really tricky time multiple years after an international pandemic, and our population is, is crying out for help, specifically from personalized care approaches. This gives us some interesting context, and the references are there if colleagues want to look into it. This is a different slant at looking at disability adjusted life years data, looking at the root causes or root factors that contribute towards why life lived less well as a result of a single condition. And this is England data. This is 2019. This is the most recent. It'll take till next year to get the 2020 data. But you'll note that the largest root factor contributing towards disability adjusted life years, or life lived less well from a condition, is behavioral. The second most reason is metabolic, and the third is environmental. What interventions are most effective at addressing behavioral problems? This audience here knows exactly the answer to that question. This is your superpower. Your place in the health and care system will bring about the change that this global burden of disease is seeing on the people of England. This is the most evidence-based interventions. It's not surgery, it's not medicines, it's not medical treatments, it's behavioral treatments, it's coaching, it's supported self-management. This is the change that we need to start to see, and this is the root reason for people living less well in England. This is also looking at disability adjusted life years data. And again, just to orient you to it, the top axis shows dailies or disability adjusted life years per 100,000 population. So it gives a weighted amount for like a population level. And the bottom shows trend over the last three decades. The different colors show different regions or parts of England. I'm, imp I'm impressed to see that the London data, which is that bottom one, is starting to improve. So the rate of people living less well from um, uh, different multiple long-term conditions is improving or less people are ex being experiencing that. But in the north of England, it's worsening. And I'm from Newcastle and that concerns me. So there is something a little bit about the unwarranted variation that we're noticing across England in terms of this change that we're seeing if people aren't necessarily getting equal care across England on the rate of that population improvement at a macro or meta level. So the health inequalities element to this is quite significant. The unwarranted variation element to this is not insignificant, and therefore the role that health coaching and supported self-management play within that is phenomenal. There's an unbalanced element to this that we need to understand a bit more about and take back into practice. In January, Steve Barclay, our um, uh, health secretary, announced uh, a launch on the, what's called the major conditions strategy. And there's basically two parts to that, for those of you who haven't um, heard about in January. It's a really good speech and a good, uh, good outline on the UKGov website. And essentially, it launched an, uh, a commitment to look at two things. One is people with living with multi-morbidity, those with living with multiple long-term conditions, but as well as those that have the highest burden of disease. Wouldn't be surprised to know that I helped write some of the parts of that. 
um, given what I've just shared. But the reason is because these major conditions account for 60% of the disability adjusted life years of the people living in England. So there is some government emphasis on this at the moment. It's a helpful lever. It's a helpful political push. I'm not terribly political, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that. But what I would find helpful about this is this is based in science. This is based in the population needs of the moment. And this is therefore based in personalized care is the solution to this problem. And therefore, we all have a part to play within that. We all know the elements of biological, uh, the biopsychosocial model. I'm a physiotherapist by background. I forgot to say that in my intro. Um, so I only left clinical practice a few years ago. Um, and my um, passion for care was partly in biological elements of care, biomedical, but mainly in the psychosocial elements of rehabilitation. And all of, all of the colleagues here, the wonderful sessions that we have planned, are really getting under the skin of that. Based on the data that I've just shared with you, the solution to those problems is not the biomedical model. It's absolutely not. It's the other elements. And together, as we've painted the picture of the state of the nation in England and the population's um, needs at the moment, that rising tide, we need to spend some time together thinking a little bit about what are we going to do to focus on those psychosocial elements together today. And this just shows, this is about shared decision making. So this, is, this data comes from the Care Quality Commission. They survey about half a million people in England in different care settings and ask a number of patient reported experience measure questions. That fact that I shared with you at the beginning about half the people in England feel involved in the decisions about their care, this is the visual schematic of that. This data is specifically from the acute care setting. It's about 65,000 people per annum, um, but it occurs in every place-based setting, general practice children and young people, mental health, maternity services, and the data is the same. But just to see it visually, it just starts to show that correlation. And again, in the GP survey, which is a slightly different, um, uh, slightly different um, uh, da data dashboard, the findings are consistent. Again, what does this tell us about quadruple aims? We're not getting it right. And we haven't done for over a decade. So supported self-management is one of, in my opinion, one of those underutilized evidence-based and cost-effective healthcare interventions that the NHS can offer, it reduces the pressures on the system. It improves people's quality of life. 38% fewer emergency admissions, 32% li less likely to attend an A&E, 18% fewer GP appointments when someone has a targeted approach to their levels of activation or um, their level of health literacy and, and through a health coaching approach, through the highest um, evidence-based interventions of supported self-management, including structured self-management education, health coaching, and peer support. The support that peers can give each other and the networks that we create within that are not insignificant. And this really helps manage that rising tide of demand that we're seeing, again, that occurs after a pandemic. How many health coaches have we got here? Hey, happy days. Um, I am the SRO in NHS England for currently for, the, for your portfolios and uh, in NHS England terms on the additional roles reimbursement scheme. Um, we have seen a tremendous increase in the number of health and wellbeing coaches that are part of primary care networks. Um, and at the moment, it's hovering at about 1,300 at the moment, which is a huge increase in the number of professionals um, who play an active and passionate role to ambassadorize this change that we've described here today. And this is the number of people being supported from that. Nearly 300,000 people are being supported at the moment as a result of your direct input. So thank you. Our focus in NHS England for 2023, unsurprisingly, revolves around this year of care model, the house of care. Colleagues will probably be familiar with it, but for those who aren't, on the, um, on the right, it's about health and care professionals committed to partnership working. The left, engaged, informed patients, people, populations, carers as a part of the health and care system. They are involved and informed and engaged. The infrastructure is supportive of that on the top at an organizational level. This includes leadership, culture, health care system, the, the talk to each other, you know, uh, the, the, the data entry systems, et cetera, and effective commissioning. And if we get all of this right, this is the evidence-based model for the how, how we can start to see that change. So here we are today, in the middle of all of that, acknowledging these different aspects to that house of care. We do acknowledge those system-wide pressures, though, that we're under at the moment. And if implemented well, 
a personalized care approach can see up to 950 million um, of targeted, through targeted peer support, um, we could see those benefits realized. And so there's a, a moment in time in the context of this rising tide that we're all here to bring about that change. And I know we have some, help, some other um, non-health coach uh, workforce members here today as well, but specifically, you are not just health coaches, you are agents of change. You will be able to bring about the, this cultural and transformational shift. Your superpowers are both valued and valuable in the context of the change of the population of England and the change that we need to see. You make the case for personalized care. You make the case through health coaching and supported self-management, and you demonstrate that by empowering people and populations to take active control of their health and care. And you show that expertise day in and day out, so thank you. This quote uh, is a, a favorite of mine, um, and I use it in terms of data. It's an, a Native American proverb, again, showing my American roots. It takes a thousand voices to tell a single story. Why am I ending with that? Two reasons. The data that I shared with you is the voices of our people. Thousands and thousands of voices are, sc are screaming at us through that data, saying that they're not receiving personalized care. And I feel hopeful. The second story for this is the story that we make today. What story are we going to take away today from this as to the change that we're going to take back into our practice nationally, regionally, and through networks? So I challenge you today to think about what story are you going to take forward today in the context of this very rising tide, this very difficult demand, and what are we going to do next? Thank you very much.